All right. So welcome to the Winter Waterfowl and Seal webinar. So today we'll be talking about the different places to spot seals and wintering waterfowl and different birds. Um, what when like good times are to go, uh, features of them, how to identify. And I'll give you guys a little bit of background about the American Literal Society as well. But if any of you here are unfamiliar with myself, uh, I'm Nicole Haynes, the Education Director for the American Literal Society. So it's wonderful to have you all here. Let's see, next slide. Okay, so if anyone is not super familiar with the American Literal Society, here's just a little bit of background along with a photo of myself and my pup sitting on the front steps of our headquarters. We are located at Sandy Hook, that's our headquarters, so in New Jersey. And we also have an office down in Millville, New Jersey, uh, so South Jersey, and then an office in Jamaica Bay, Queens, up in New York. Those are our three locations, and then we have a guy that does kayaking tours down in Florida. Um, but overall, I'll give you a little update as to what we're working on right now, because I'm sure there's a good amount of you that know kind of what we are as a whole. So I'd like to give current updates. So right now, as far as education goes, um, what we're working on is just a lot of our seal and waterfall, waterfowl walks, um, our eco cruises and webinars. Since it's colder months, this is kind of what we focus on. And then I kind of sporadically fit in there um, my zero waste webinars and then also um, programs that have to do with our Shuck It, Don't Chuck It program, but I'll speak on that in just a second. But uh, if you guys are interested, we I do run walks where you can come out and learn about the seal and waterfowl and see them in person. And we walk around Sandy Hook. We drive to a few different locations. We dress nice and warm. And then we also do eco cruises every Saturday out of the Highlands with the Sea Street Cruise. So we've created a partnership with them. You can buy tickets through their website, but it's also advertised on our website. And then we go out and we take a look at the different um, seals, birds, ducks, and landmarks that we might pass. So we might go under the Verrazano Bridge, past Coney Island, uh, we go past Sandy Hook. So it's just a nice way to see everything and also stay inside a nice warm boat. Um, but if you get woozy on boats, we do the webinars and we do the walks. But everything changes as the weather changes. So always be sure to check out our website for um, what we currently are offering education-wise. And then as far as advocacy work goes, uh, we are always advocating for so, so many things like clean water, access to public beaches. Um, but what we're working on specifically right now is a program called SAFE. And that works out of like the Camden area. And it's an acronym. SAFE stands for Swimmable, Accessible, Fishable, and Equitable Rivers. So what we're doing is we're trying to bring awareness of the pollution that has happened in the part of the Delaware that's near uh, Philadelphia and Camden over the years bring awareness to it, clean the river up, and then bring the people in that area outside to recreate, whether they're kayaking, canoeing, fishing, anything along those lines. So that's a great program that we've been working on for a little while right now. Um, and then as far as our restoration team goes, it kind of falls hand in hand with our shell recycling program. So our restoration team is currently building reefs in different areas of New Jersey. What they're doing, and the most recent one they built is actually in Forked River, so a little bit further south than Tom's River. And it's like these giant baskets, like cages, I'd say. We call them HESCO baskets. And they're filled with recycled shell. So it might be like whelk shell. It might be um, oyster shell, anything along those lines. It's filled up. And we, we have a half mile of those HESCO baskets placed out along the bay um, in Forked River or in that Tom's River area. And it's supposed to help to uh, slow down erosion and wave uh, strength as it comes in towards people's homes because they've lost a lot of their land over the years. So we're hoping to kind of build that back up with this reef here, just kind of um, building up more sediment and sand in the area. And then also becoming a habitat for different creatures um, and cleaning up water quality. Because as we put live oysters, which we did seed it or put many, many live oysters into the reef, millions. Um, oysters will filter the water. So one oyster can filter up to 50 gallons per day. They might do a little less, but that's still fantastic. So we're looking to clean up those waters, stop the erosion, um, slow those wave strengths, and create great habitat for other animals. But what we also have in association with that program 
is um yeah i know the slide's still on the headquarters this is just me giving you guys a background um i don't have updated pictures from them on their reef right now but i think they have a blog post if you guys actually want to see photos and check it out um and then we also have a shuck it don't chuck it shell recycling program so we go to restaurants in monmouth and ocean county where we collect oyster shell clam shell and mussel shell as well but mostly oyster shell from those restaurants instead of it going to a garbage or landfill we take that shell back to sandy hook it sits in a massive pile where it gets uh, time to like cure or get the bacteria off of it. And then we use that shell, like I just said, in those reefs. And then it's um, kind of coming full circle, taking it out of the environment, putting it back into the environment. And we're teaching people about aquaculture and our local oyster farmers. So that's kind of what that refers to. But we have events called Sip and Shuck, where you can come out, listen to us, speak about the program, listen to the oyster farmers speak about how they run everything on their end. You learn how to shuck an oyster. So open up an oyster, get to eat them. You usually get to have a drink with us and then uh, ask questions. So it's a really fun event. And then our last aspect uh, of, the little of the literal society is our fish tagging program. So we have a great fish tagging program. If you're interested, you can buy Oop, sorry. Hey there, calm down. You can buy tags from us. And you can go out on your own time and tag local species like striped bass or fluke. And you give us data like where you were, the length of the fish, the weight of the fish. Um, and then we put that all into a database. We share it with government agencies and then it helps them to regulate how many fish people can take each year. Um, so we're not overfishing our waterways. So that's just a little snippet of us. Let me go to my next slide. Here we are. So here's just a little few pictures from my past walks and educational events. So on the top right, you can see our lovely little seal friends hanging out on um, a sandbar that's up at Sandy Hook. Uh, the picture all the way down on the bottom are some private walks I've done for homeschool groups. They uh, really love coming out and learning all about the different creatures. Um, and then the picture on the left is just a public walk that I had uh, a few years ago. So it's a great time if you wanna come out with us. We just, we bundle up cause it gets real windy near the beach. All right, so for those of you who would like to go out on your own time and look for these fun creatures, um, I'll give you guys a few different recommendations as to where you can go. So right here, we're looking at a map of, on the right, uh, this is just taken from Google Maps, and this is just looking at Sandy Hook as a whole. And on the left, this is zoomed in into the Fort Hancock area. So if you guys can see my mouse, right up here is Fort Hancock. Um, where this yellow star is, that's our building. And then the map on the left is just a zoomed in version. So it's showing all the buildings that are over there. Um, but where I do recommend to go to see potential seals, birds and ducks, right now for the seals, where I've really just been seeing them the past two-ish years has been by um, the, kind of by this ferry dock over here, there is a chapel. So it's just a white chapel that's along the bay. And there is um, a jetty that kind of sticks out here. And when it goes to low tide, so you want to look for low tide, um, you'll see the rocks will be exposed and the seals will typically come and lay out on those rocks there. But we do ask that people keep their distance. I mean, there is a fence there, but still, this is wildlife. We have to respect their home and where they hang out. Um, but that's where they've been going recently. In the past, they used to go to a sandbar. Um, kind of across from sea lot. So if you see my mouse kind of in this area, but unfortunately they, we have not seen them there in the past two-ish years. You never know, they might come back and hang out there. I think it may have been due to just too many people um, just kind of crowding them like boats and different vessels and such. We're not exactly sure, but that might be a reason. Uh, but for now, down by the chapels where we see the seals, and then we do see them in the open ocean and the open bay. It's just a little bit harder to spot them, but you can see the little heads pop up. Sometimes they're actually jumping in, in and out of the water. So it's pretty fun. Um, and then as far as our birds and ducks, where we can typically see them is if you come into Sandy Hook, so all the way down here, bottom right corner, and then you park in B lot. So that's our second lot. You walk to the bayside and there's something called Plum Island. It's kind of like an estuary area. And a lot of our wintering birds and ducks will hang out over there. You can also go up and park um, 
at in between D and E lot, there is actually our old visitor center with like kind of a lookout on the top, but it's in between D and E lot. There's like a circle lot. And if you park there, you can walk across the street and there's a boardwalk that juts out um, looking at the bay. There's lots of birds and ducks over there. You can go down by the Coast Guard station, which is right by the chapel, same area. The birds and ducks are there as well, as well as the seals. Um, Horseshoe Cove. So Horseshoe Cove is right before Fort Hancock. So let's see, kind of in this area right here where my mouse is, it is labeled. So it'll say Horseshoe Cove. Um, I think the lot for it in the winter, you're able to park in it. It's um, in the summer, it's for campers only. But there's a lot right before it. I believe it's lot at L that you can park in. Um, but since we're in the winter, you can park in that camper lot, which is great. And then you just walk across the street. And then um, all the way at the end, down here, there's M lot. If you walk out towards North Beach, there is a pond out there. And then if you just walk to like the very tip of Sandy Hook, which is a bit of a journey, you will see some different birds and ducks out there. You might even get to spot some gannets, which I find very interesting. They, um, they're very, almost look like a very large seagull with yellow on the edge of their wings, um, kind of a goldish color but they swim in this like tornado-like pattern and they dive into the water to feed for different fish. So you might see them down there. Um, and then just in the open ocean. So you can go anywhere on the beach side and kind of look. So I'll kind of talk about where certain birds and ducks like to hang out. Some of them like estuaries, some of them like rivers, some of them like ocean. So it depends. All right. And I always like to make um, a quick point about keeping your distance, being respectful. They are wildlife. It's fun to see them, but we want to make sure that we're being respectful. And if we see um, an, a mammal or a bird or a duck that we think is injured, we can also call for help. So if you want to feel free, you can, um, if you know how to screenshot on your computer, a lot of time it's the print screen button. If you want to take a picture with your phone of this slide. If you're ever out and you just see something that looks injured, there's a few numbers to call. Um, based on where you are for birds and ducks. And on the right side, there's the number for the Marine Mammal Stranding Center. So that's down in Brigantine, but um, we've called them before when we've seen seals or actually sea turtles that have looked injured. And they come and pick them up, bring them back down to Brigantine. Uh, they put them through rehabilitation and then they release them back into the ocean once they're all healed. So they're a great center. All righty, <laughs> excuse me. So we have our seal friends, which I like to call the dogs of the sea. Um, my old coworker used to like to call them charismatic megafauna because everybody likes to see them and they are quite, they're a, a bigger uh, creature, not huge though. So they are called pinnipeds. Um, and this is any kind of animal of that suborder, pinnipedia but they're aquatic and carnivorous mammals. So they live in the water and they will eat different types of other creatures. So, um, and they have all four of their limbs that are flippers. So you can see these pictures here. This picture on the left actually is a seal that one year was on the side of the beach uh, with us. Normally they're all kind of out on that sandbar in the past or now out on the jetty. And this one was on our side. So that was an instance where we called the Marine Mammal Stranding Center because we were a little concerned as to why it was on our side where all the humans go and not with all the seals. Um, it ended up being okay, but you never know. Okay. And so I can give you guys some fun facts about our seals. So what we're looking at um, in the picture in the bottom right with them all laying out, what we call that is hauling out. Uh, and what they're doing when they're hauling out is they are most likely warming up because um, seals don't have as much like blubber and body fat as like a whale does. So they can't keep themselves as warm. So they do need to lay out in the sun um, or just get out of the water for a little bit and maintain their body temperature. They're usually also um, either resting or they are digesting their food. So if they're in the water and they're using a lot of energy in this cold water to maintain their body temperature, then they don't have as much energy to um, digest their food. So it's important for them to do all of those things. But they will haul out for anywhere from 
six plus hours a day if, if the land is exposed. So at Sandy Hook, it's kind of tide based, but if the land is there, they'll lay out and they will warm up their bodies. Um, and hopefully everyone can get a good view of them. But usually what we're seeing as far as types of seal, there's three we can see. So there's harbor seal, which is pretty much what we're always seeing. You can kind of see on this uh, seal's nose, it's kind of V-shaped. So our harbor seals have that V-shaped nostril. And then we have gray seals. They, uh, people like to say they kind of have like a horse head, it's like a longer head. And then we have harp seals. Uh, but usually like 90% of the time, what you're seeing is harbor seals. Let me go to my next slide. So here's a good picture. Um, actually, this top left picture is of one of the seals being released from the Marine Ramble Stranding Center. So you can see it's kind of coming out of a, a giant dog cage and they kind of coerce it towards the water. Um, and while they look super cute and adorable, they are not very friendly. Um, I've seen during these releases that the seals get pretty aggressive because they there's a crowd that's usually watching when they're being released. So people get very excited, but we're trying to like urge the seal back into the water. Um, and they do kind of like hiss or growl in a way. So they are um, not the most friendly, but they're very cute to look at. And um, so our adult females, uh, they for sizing will usually be around 200 pounds and about four and a half feet long. And then our males will be about 150 pounds to 300 pounds and roughly six feet long. And what our seal friends are eating are typically fish and squid. Um, any different varying types of fish that are kind of in the area. And they can live about 25 years. Their predators will fall under orcas, sharks, polar bears, depending on where they are. So of course we don't have um, orcas and polar bears in New Jersey. So they are probably just looking out for sharks around this area. Uh, luckily I've never seen one being attacked by one. Hopefully I do not, but um, they seem pretty safe over here. And uh, with our females, they will typically um, hold their pups in their system. So they'll have a gestation period of about nine to 11 months. And they'll usually give birth between the spring and the summer. They do give birth on the land and they'll give birth to about one pup per year. So usually um, when the seals are not here, they head up north anywhere from like Cape Cod and more north up to the Arctic. But as it gets cold, um, they usually come to Sandy Hook area around December into March. Um, usually the safest bet is between January and March, uh, but I have seen them stay as late as April and they have arrived like even late November, but your safe bet is January through March to see them. Um, some fun facts about our seal friends are that they actually, so if you can see in the, some of the pictures, they have really large eyes and they're dark. So those eyes, um, they help to see in the dark. So they are diving down for their food in the water and it's not super bright down there. So they have those bigger eyes that can see a little bit better um, and catch those fish. And then, um, so they can dive for about three minutes at a time, but they'll stay underwater for as long as 30 minutes. And they can dive up to about 1600 feet down under the water. So they can go pretty deep. They don't typically go that deep, but they can. Um, and so for instance, when we go and we dive underwater, usually what you're doing is taking in a nice deep breath and then you're going down underwater. What the seals actually do is they will breathe out before diving and they use the oxygen already in their blood and in their muscles while they're underwater and their heartbeat can slow from about a hundred beats per minute down to 10. So that's pretty wild. Um, it's a little backwards versus what we do. And um, actually in one breath, a seal can exchange about 90% of the air in its lungs. So they're pretty efficient, whereas humans can only change about 20% of air. Um, so they're pretty incredible creatures. And they do have whiskers, just like many other creatures do. So those whiskers will help it to hunt and navigate because they can kind of sense the pressure of waves and the pressure from fish and different objects underwater. Um, they also will sleep in the water as well as on land. So they will rest on land, but they'll also sleep in the water. They'll kind of sleep bobbing up and down, kind of like that. Um, so like floating in a way. And so because they're sleeping, here, 
and then they're not actively swimming. They can stay underwater a lot longer in those instances. And then they are protected by the Marine Mammal Stranding Act. So whenever we're out on our eco cruise, we do keep our distance. Um, if the seals end up popping up near us, you know, we don't move any closer or if they are close to us, we won't move the boat because we don't want to injure any seals that we are aware of. Um, and we do keep our distance. So I believe for it's about like 100 yards away from whales, but then it's 50 yards from dolphins, porpoises, seals, et cetera. And actually on two or three of our cruises so far this year, we saw whales. It's been very exciting. I saw three humpback whales on our first cruise. And right here, I have a video um, of a seal on a rock. Wait. There's another one popping its head up behind the uh, harbor so there we saw some two seals um hanging out on the rocks and this is off the coast of the sandy hook area but i think i have one more video on my next slide let me just click over to it it might not let me because of video there we go here we go here's one more video of some seals hanging out on the rocks <laughs> All right, so there's my two videos. And I see I have a question, so good question. How badly are they affected by noise pollution? So I know a lot of people have been um, very curious about noise pollution in terms of just like shipping containers maybe coming through the area or even um, some wind development and such. So, I mean, seals do use um, their, they communicate and they can detect predators and prey by using different sound and whatnot. So I know as far as like for building wind turbines out in the water, what is required of them is they kind of create this like bubble barrier that will help to block out the noise of what they're doing. Um, so I don't particularly know how bad seals could be affected out by like that kind of work, but they also don't really go deep out um, where work is occurring. They don't really like to be by um, the like large ships and a lot of construction and such. So they'll usually stay near areas where they can like hop up onto rocks or to land and they can haul out as I talked about. Um, but if there is a lot of noise, it can kind of get in the way of them communicating or hearing prey and stuff like that or predators. Um, but I'll have to see if there's any research specifically being done on them. I was only aware of the NOAA lab doing research on blackfish. And I see, do the seals stay around Sandy Hook till the end of March or are they gone by the beginning of March? No, typically they stay till the end of March. I mean, I've even seen them into April. Um, so it's pretty safe bet that we still see them in March because it's still pretty cold here, but we'll kind of see with climate change and everything um, if that starts to change. So I usually like to take note each year if anything is differing, but I have seen them in March every year. Okay, I can't click past that. Here we go. And feel free if anybody has any more questions as we go, type it in the chat, you can unmute yourself. Um, so that's kind of a little spiel on the seals. I don't wanna uh, overwhelm you guys with information on them, but I, if you have any more questions, I'm very happy to answer. 
Um, so I always do like to talk about the snowy owl. The snowy owl is always a very elusive bird that people are looking for um, around the winter time. And so the characteristics of our snowy owls are that females actually have the much darker markings on their feathers. So this picture you see here is a female snowy owl, whereas a male will be all white. And they do have yellow eyes. Um, they cannot move their eyes. So uh, most owls cannot move their eyes and they will move their heads. They can rotate their heads up to 270 degrees, which is pretty far around, um, but that will help them to see around them. And they do have a protruding eyelid. So eyelids that kind of come out a little bit, almost like a visor, and it helps to protect them from the sun. Because as you can see, they kind of like to lay or sit in the sand in that direct sunlight. So it helps to protect them. And um, they are completely covered in feathers. Even their feet are covered in feathers. And it does help to keep them warm um, because these owls do typically like to live up in very cold areas, like uh, up in the Arctic. So those feathers on their feet is very important. So here, here's a great picture where you guys can see how the feathers continue all the way down to their feet. Most birds do not have that, but these birds do require it due to the cold temperatures they're living in. And this again right here is another picture of a female because it have, has all those dark brown markings. So what they usually eat are different um, small creatures. So like lemmings, Arctic hares, mice, ducks, seabirds. Um, they will small swallow their smaller prey whole. And um, in the Arctic summer, so since the, the sun is out pretty much all day, all night, they will hunt during the day because they have no choice. But um, when they come south, they do prefer to hunt at night. And they're what we call diurnal. So they'll kind of um, hunt during either. And as far as their wingspan goes, it's around four to six feet. So that's fairly large. Mm -hmm. um, they are uh, one of the larger owls and they're very powerful wings kind of give them the ability to silently sneak up on their prey. You would think they'd be pretty loud, but they are quite quiet. Um, their habitat, like I said, they do like to nest up in the Arctic. And as far as their non-breeding season goes, they will go to Southern Canada and then Northern US. So last year we had a really good year for snowy owls. Um, there were plenty spotted down in South Jersey around like um, Forsyth National Refuge, um, Island Beach State Park. There were some in the New York area. I think there were a few spottings at Sandy Hook. It's very difficult to find them because um, they do kind of like to hang out in the, like the low dunes and so we're not allowed to be walking along the dunes, but if you bring binoculars, you have to be very vigilant, very quiet. But a good giveaway can be if you see a bunch of cars in a certain location in the middle of winter, one can only guess that there must be something interesting there. Um, and you can go on different apps like eBird. Um, there's a few different out there where people will kind of communicate about where they've spotted birds and ducks. Some people are a little bit less forthcoming because they're just worried about too many people going out and not respecting the distance and kind of just not being respectful in general. So I always like to just make everyone very aware that this is their home. We're just visiting, we're seeing them um, to give them their space, take pictures, but really don't take anything else. Um, let's see if I have another picture. Nope, no, we don't. But then my last little bit of information is that they can live up to 10 years in the wild and up to 28 years in captivity. But what kind of life is captivity? I'm sure they much, much more prefer the wild. All right, so now we're gonna get into our wintering um, ducks. And so what I like to give as background information for our wintering ducks and our birds are how to identify them. So a lot of the times, if you come out on like an eco cruise or a walk, these creatures will be very far away. Um, so we'll of course have our binoculars, but there are plenty of people that can just kind of see it either in the air or in the water and know within a minute or less what it is. And you can't even see up close as to what it is. So I can give you guys a few tips and tricks on how you can also do that. Um, one great trick is that we have two different types of ducks. We have dabbling ducks and we have diving ducks. 
So our dabbling ducks are those ones that kind of tip their butts up in the air and they're looking for food. Whereas our diving ducks are fully submerging their, some, themselves under the water to look for food. Um, so that's a big difference there. And that will kind of eliminate a lot of ducks when you're looking. So say you're looking into the water, you see a duck that just dove under the water for food. You're like, okay, I can eliminate like 10 different birds or 10 different ducks because I know that those 10 ducks tip their little booties up looking for water. Um, so our different types of dabbling ducks that we might see are the American black duck, a blue winged teal or a green winged teal, um, mallards, northern pintail, and a wood duck. So those are just a few to list. And then the different diving ducks that we might see are common golden eye, a black scoter, buffle heads, um, a common, a hooded, or a red-breasted merganser, greater or lesser scot, harlequin ducks, a long-tailed duck, surf scoter, and a white wing scoter. So we seem to have more um, diving ducks within the region. But as far as our dowling ducks, they do typically like um, shallower waters, like flooded fields or marshes. And they will usually swim with their tail like clear above the water and have um, what we like to call an iridescent speculum. So it's an area kind of in the back of their wing back here, if you can see my mouse. So it's got kind of like a shiny, pretty color to it there. And, um, and then, yeah, I gave you the species. And then our diving ducks, they will usually like to hang in larger, deep lakes, uh, sometimes rivers, coastal bays, inlets. They do, they will hang out in marshes as well. We have, um, I'll talk about a type that we see a lot. Um, and they usually have a very rapid wing beat uh, when they take off for flight. So then another thing we wanna look at besides how they're eating is how they're flying. So we have um, two different ways that they're gonna take off. We have our ducks that will spring off of the water and just take off immediately. And then we have our ducks that will kind of need a running start like an airplane. So that again, will help us to distinguish. And a lot of the times our diving ducks, um, they are the ones that need that running start. Whereas our dabbling ducks will take off right away from the water. So if you maybe didn't get a chance to see how it's feeding, but you saw how it took off the water, that's a great tell as well. And then um, I'll talk about characteristics as we go into each duck as well. So the one we're looking at right now, this is a common loon. We do see these a good amount. Loon is the name of my dog, but um, they are, they kind of have a eerie sound as people have said. So you'll hear them a lot up in like the Adirondacks and they kind of have like this eerie, um, like cooing sound almost, but they are low swimming birds. And so they have a very dagger-like bill as you can see in this photo and kind of um, a reddish eye. And like I said, that eerie haunting call. And ducks will a lot of times have their breeding plumage um, and then they'll have their non-breeding plumage. So right here, we're looking at our non-breeding plumage. Um, so we're looking at the duck in the winter. And with our ducks, our males are almost all the time going to be the ones that have uh, more char characteristics like colors and patterns and different things like that. They're the ones that look prettier because they want to attract the mate. Whereas the females will look similar but um, more brown, like less markings and less colors. And our loons, they'll eat, they are carnivores. They'll dive for fish, crayfish, shrimp, leeches even, um, and they will dive to catch their prey. They do take off like an airplane. They need that running start. And as far as their habitat, they are migratory. So they'll live in one, one spot and then they'll fly to another to breed. They also stay close to larger bodies of water, uh, no matter where they are. And the picture we're actually looking at right now is a, a poor loon that was frozen onto a lake. Like all you could see all the water is frozen below it. So I believe um, it had to be rescued. It couldn't get itself off of there. And they typically get their name from the fact that they walk very clumsily on land. Um, so their legs are kind of placed further back on their body. So they don't walk too well, but they are really good swimmers. But as far as walking goes, they look like loons. Okay, so then here is a picture of our common loon with its breeding plumage. So I'll just kind of go back and we see that kind of plainer color, the brown. And then we'll look at this beautiful breeding plumage. Kind of looks like a checkerboard. 
still has that red eye, still has that dagger-like beak. Um, and if you saw it walk, you would see its legs further back walking clumsily. But um, this is the breeding plumage that the males will have to attract their females. And then another type of loon we have is the red-throated loon. So this loon, as it says, has the red throat. So if you take a look at the, where is my mouse going? There we are. Um, the front of the neck, it has kind of like, almost like that burgundy color. They also have a dagger-like bill. It kind of points up a little bit. Um, and you can see in this bottom right photo, actually there's a little, little baby duck loon under its wing, very small, kind of hard to see. Um, but the, the picture on the left is gonna be its non-breeding plumage. And then it's gonna have that red marking when it's in its breeding plumage. So it doesn't always have that red patch, um, but there are other ways to tell kind of what it is, the beak, the eye, um, the different way that it's um, swimming or flying. And so they actually enjoy um, freshwater ponds, lakes and wetlands. And they'll live along like coastlines um, in the winter time but they usually need like clearer water to spot their food. And actually, unlike the common loon, these ones do not take off like an airplane. Uh, they will just explode right off the water. Which is a weird way to say it. it kind of sounds like the duck is just exploding, but they're just taking off right from the water. And then we have our mallard. Um, I'm sure plenty of people have seen like uh, the little wooden designed mallards that people like to have for decoration. But um, so these two, we have a picture of a male and a female here. And this part back here, you can see its feathers. Oops, where is my mouse again? Freaking out. Okay. This part back here that kind of looks like a darkish purple, that's that speculum area. So that shiny iridescent speculum area. But the one in the bottom right, this is the female. So it's got the brown coloring. And then the top left is the male. So it has a very iridescent green head. Um, a longer, flatter yellow bill, and then kind of a lighter brown body. So their heads look very similar in the shape of their bills, um, but in, in the coloring and the patterns, very different. But you'll typically see them together because sometimes if you just see a female, it could be hard to identify, but you'll usually see them together. Um, so these ones, they don't dive for their food, they dabble, so they stick their little booties up in the air. And they're usually eating seeds and aquatic vegetation. And um, in their breeding season, they will eat like animal matter. So they'll eat like larvae or worms, snails, freshwater shrimp. Um, and then in migration, they'll eat actually agricultural seed and grain. So they'll even go for that. Um, our migrating mallards have been clocked at going up to 55 miles per hour. So they can, they can fly pretty fast. They enjoy wetland habitats, lakes, and ponds. And uh, our fun fact for them is that the oldest mallard recorded was 27 years old. So it's pretty dang old for a duck. And then here's just a map of, to show you um, where they may go. So that uh, top part, that's more of like a mid-colored blue. That's where they'll be breeding. And then where they kind of like to live year round is throughout most of the United States. Um, which is that greenish color. And then down along the bottom, that orange color is well, they'll winter. So they like to stay in those warmer temperatures. They'll head down to Florida, Georgia, um, Texas, anywhere like that. And even a little bit into Mexico. All right, so we have the American black duck. So the, from far away, they do look black, but realistically they're actually just a very deep brown. And they have a similar shape to that mallard. So kind of that similar bill shape and head shape. But um, the difference here is that the male black duck looks nothing like a male mallard. We don't have that green head, that very bright yellow bill. They're mostly all dark brown. Um, when they fly, you can see the silver lining under their wing. So it helps to identify them in flight. And then again, on the speculum, we kind of have like a bluish color rather than that purple and a black border around it. Um, and then we also have, let's see, just, they the males and females look pretty similar because they're both just very dark brown. Um, but what they like to eat is mostly plant matter. Sometimes they'll eat insects 
and they will dive to avoid predators and sometimes to find food, but they are dabblers for finding food. Their flight, they are slow and heavy flyers, but they're very good swimmers. Um, and they do take off right away from the water. They like to be in wetland areas and they will winter in like salt water along the coast. Um, and a fun fact about our American black duck is that they will return to the same marsh each fall and they would rather starve themselves than migrate further if said marsh is frozen. So they're a stubborn duck. Okay, next slide here. Okay, one of my favorites actually, this is the bufflehead. So this is our smallest diving and sea duck in North America. They are super adorable in my opinion. Um, they get their name from what we think is like buffalo head because they have a large head. So we call them buffalo head. And they kind of have what looks like a um, white like triangular pizza pie piece, like a slice in the back of their head. And then the rest of their head is from far away looks black, but it has like some iridescent colors to it. So you can see in this picture on the bottom right, the male has that big pizza pie white slice and then is mostly black. And then the female still has kind of a similar marking, that white patch, but she's brown. Um, you can see the very like roundish shape of their head. They are a very small duck. They do dive for their food. They can stay under pretty long. So sometimes when we spot them, I'm like, oh, there's a bubble. Oh, hold on, wait a minute, it's underwater. Um, so that'll also help you to identify them because you'll see, oh, it went underwater. So I can cancel out all my dabbling ducks. Um, but they will dive for insects, crustaceans, and mollusks. And they will stay under from like 13 to 20 ish seconds usually. They do um, take off straight from the water, which is different than most diving ducks. Most diving ducks need that running start. They like to winter in bays, estuaries, and reservoirs. So I see them a lot at like B lot at Sandy Hook. Um, and then usually around like that boardwalk area as well between D and E lot. Uh, and then yeah, I told you guys the fun fact about them with their buffalo head, their buffalo head. But let's see what they have next. All right. So here we have a ruddy duck. So the ruddy duck, a few characteristics we can note right off the bat, is kind of like a, a scoop-ish bill. Um, they kind of have a tail that points more straight up, and it's a bit of a bigger tail. They are a bigger duck in general. Um, and then when the, the ducks are breeding, the, their bill kind of looks bluish with that chestnut body. Um, and what they like to eat is aquatic invertebrates. They will eat um, different larvae. They like to eat mostly at night and they'll strain like mud and such through their bill to get to the actual food. As far as habitat, they do like marshes near lakes and ponds. Um, in winter, they will go to like shallow protected saltwater bays and then coastal estuaries with other diving ducks. And their fun fact about them is that they lay the largest egg of any duck in the world. So it's a pretty, pretty big egg. I've never seen the egg myself, though, but as far as ducks go, it's the largest. Okay, now we have our northern pintail. Um, let's see, our northern pintail. Just trying to check my timing. Ooh, went a little long. Okay, so this one, this is like a slimmer, longer duck. Um, it's actually called the Greyhound of the Air. But sometimes people confuse these with the long tail duck just because it has that longer tail, but you have to look at the other characteristics of it. It has that dark brown head, that kind of white um, vertical stripe that comes up its neck. Um, but these ones, they will take off right away off the water. Um, they'll eat different seeds and grains and they will eat like um, invertebrates and they dabble for their food. So they just tip their little butts up um, and they're known to just be much more of an elegant duck and they like shallow wetlands and exposed mud flats. Here we have a ring-necked duck. So this ring-necked duck um, really should be a ring bill because mm -hmm. you're not really, I don't, see the ring neck to it too much it's kind of hard to see but they um they can also look a little bit similar to our greater and lesser scop but what you see is the two white rings along the bill 
Um, and then they're mostly black. It almost looks like they have hair combed back. They have that orangey eye. Um, and you can see that the females kind of have, um, actually, I think they ha yeah, it has a ring around its bill as well, but it's really dull to see. So that's why it's, it's always easier to look at our male ducks. They do need that running start to take off. Um, they usually like to be in slow moving rivers, sometimes coastal estuaries. And um, they are very fast flyer actually. So they will undertake longer migrations than other diving ducks because they can fly so much faster. Okay, here we see a lot of greater scalp. So we have um, greater and lesser scalp look super, super similar. Um, I have not quite mastered telling the two of them apart out in the wild because I mean, they're usually far away and they do look so similar. This is what we would call a raft of scalp, so like a group of them. But they have um, kind of a, a barred gray back and then a black front and white sides. And adults in their second year have that yellow eye. And they do have a larger bill and head than the lesser scalp. They like to eat mollusks and plant material. And um, so right here, we'll see them kind of in what you call rafts of thousands. So that's like a group of them. Um, it's supposedly said that they get their name from kind of how they sound. So that like scop scop sound. And um, they tend to hang out more so like in the open ocean, um, but generally like saltwater bodies. So here we have a picture of both. Um, we can see up in the top left, we have our greater scop. In the bottom right, we have our lesser. Um, so you can kind of see the head difference here. One's rounder, one kind of comes to like the tiniest little point. One's bill is bigger, but again, the coloring is so similar. It is really hard to distinguish, but I mean, I would say as long as you can tell that it's a scop in general, you're pretty good to go. Um, and they have pretty much the same characteristics here. So here's our long tailed duck. This is the one that people can confuse um, for that pintail. They don't necessarily look the same, it's just that long tail that throws people off. So um, we can see it kind of has almost like a funky geometric pattern to it here. Um, and it has a pink almost stripe around its beak, but it does have that long tail. When it's in flight, it almost has like a white V to it, as you can see in this top right photo. Um, so they do like to eat mollusks and crustaceans. They will fly with uh, very stiff and shallow wing beats and they'll kind of tilt from side to side. So it can help to identify them in flight. You'll find them on the open ocean and they can actually dive more than 200 feet below the surface. So they can dive a little bit further than a lot of other ducks. So here we have our surf scoters. Um, so these are our last, uh, or, or three, I think we have three different types of scoters here. They all are pretty funky looking as far as their bills go. So our surf scoter, scoter has like the biggest bill, kind of looks swollen. Um, it's orange and reddish and has black and white to it as well. And it has that white patch along the back of its neck. Um, so they're pretty funky looking. And if you get binoculars, pretty easy to identify. They will dive for their food and take prey from the ocean floor, usually different types of mussels and stuff off of man-made structures. They are stronger flyers. Um, they like open coastal environments. So a lot of times we'll see them in the open ocean. And um, they have a nickname because of its like coloring and such called the skunk-headed coot. So very weird nickname. We could see the female still has that kind of swollen bill, some white to it, but still looks very different. So we have our black scoter, again, kind of has that swollen bill, except the black part is thin. And then it has that orangey yellow part right above it. And then the whole duck is black. Um, so hence the name, but these, ha uh, they will dive for their food as well. So they will usually be in open ocean. They are strong flyers, but they do need that running start. Um, and they are among the most vocal waterfowl. So they'll be sometimes a lot louder than others. And we're gonna see our last scoter on the next one. So we have our white wing scoter. So again, looking at that bill, pretty funky, looks a little swollen. This has a longer bill, 
Um, but it again has like the yellowy orange, red, white, and black to it. Um, so it's just like, if you see these funky looking bills, you can know like, okay, it must be a scoter. Which one is it? So if it's all black, we can say easy black scoter. Um, this one is also pretty easily known because of its name. So white wing scoter, do we see that white part on its speculum? Yes. Okay, great. It's a white wing scoter and it has that almost like white Nike symbol under its eye there. But then if we don't see those, um, whether it's all black or it has the white wing, we can say, okay, must be a surf scoter. And that's the one with the biggest bill. And then we have Harlequin ducks. Um, those are known to be seen a lot of the times down by Barnegat Bay because they do like to live um, in like rivers or rocky areas. So they're kind of in that inlet region. They like to eat aquatic invertebrates and fish. Um, they have very cool markings to them. So they get their name based off of like the Harlequin character with all of the like fun markings and kind of um, colors and such. So we can see it has a dot at the back of its head. It has stripes. It kind of has that chestnut color. These have very specific markings to them. So the Harlequin duck um, is much more easily noticed. And their fun fact is that they have a very rough lifestyle because they like to live in like rougher, rocky waters. And so they will usually endure a lot of broken bones over their lifetime from being tossed in the rough water. Okay, so we're gonna look at two different types of mergansers. I believe this is our, my last few slides here. So here we have the hooded merganser. So this one um, with our mergansers, they have very, thin bills and the way they have that yellow eye and so sometimes you might see its hood kind of like squished down a little bit um but a lot of the times we'll see that upright kind of has like almost that shape of the buffalo head but they don't their heads don't look like the buffalo head they kind of have a very thin short bill um and they have this yellow eye and then as far as their body color, they have more chestnut around the bottom and they have those white stripes on their chest. And then the female kind of looks like she's got some funky bedhead going on, but similar look. Um, they have a diverse diet. They'll eat fish, crustaceans, insects. Um, and they do have underwater vision. So there's a lot of types of ducks that will have a third eyelid. So they have a third eyelid that's clear and comes over their eyes to protect them for, and so they can see underwater, kind of like they're wearing goggles. Oh, here we go. So here's a picture of that hood kind of down. So I'm gonna go back, we can see it up. And then in this picture, you can kind of see it squished down. So you may see either version here, but it's still the hooded merganser. And now we have our red-breasted merganser. So this one is the one that looks a lot more like it didn't brush its hair. Or it's got a mohawk or something like that. It's what a lot of people will say. Um, they have like a reddish brown look to them. This is their breeding plumage. So they're prettier plumage. Kind of have like a thick white choker around their neck, a red eye. Again, that thin bill though. So both of those morgansers have that kind of thin long bill. Um, the black head. And then they will be diving for their food. So they're having mostly fish. They do need that running start when they take off. And um, during their migration and in the winter, they will be mostly in like salt water um, and in coastal bays and estuaries. So kind of those types of regions. And these ducks can actually reach speeds of up to 81 miles per hour. So they are very, very fast duck. All right. And something we see a lot at Sandy Hook um, is our brant geese. So these look kind of similar to our regular geese. I think I have a picture here, let's see. Here's our Canada goose. So they're bigger. They have more of a light brown and a white to them. And then they have almost like a, a white beard under their chin. Whereas our brant geese are smaller. You can see their head is smaller, their bill is smaller. They kind of have like um, a small white line under their head. And then they're mostly black. So that's kind of that difference there. Um, they will wade for their foods. So they just tip their bodies. They usually nest in Greenland above the Arctic Circle, but there's tons of them in our area right now around Sandy Hook. And they used to actually survive off of something called eelgrass, but um, then they had to convert to sea lettuce as eelgrass disappeared. 
And now they've even accustomed to eating um, lawn grass, just like our Canada goose will do. And here's just a picture of a bunch of them that you'll see floating around in the waterways. And then we see our um, Canada goose. So not the most interesting of our um, series, but we do see a lot of them around New Jersey. And unfortunately we're giving them plenty and plenty of food to eat because they love grazing on grass. Um, and I have a picture here, let's see. There were so many of them at actually an airport up in New York that they had to corral them and take about a thousand away and sent them to um, actually a food plant upstate. So um, unfortunately those Canada gooses did not make it, but there were too, too many of them hanging around the airport. So this is them being kind of corralled away. Um, and yeah, so that kind of brings us to our close here today. If you guys have any questions at all, you can ask me right now. Um, you can unmute yourself. You can type in the chat. You can always email me. You should all have my email now. Um, but I thank everybody for listening today. You can follow us on social media. You can um, come out to any of our events. Many of them are free. Some of them are just a small fee. Uh, but I thank everybody for coming today and I hope you enjoyed it. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Have a great day. Enjoy that it's a little bit warmer now. <laughs> and please send us the link so we can watch this over and over again a hundred times. <laughs> sure, yeah. I'll send you guys the recording as well. Um, right. well. That'll probably be sent a little bit later this week once we convert it. But absolutely, I can do that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy. I hope you learn. Did enjoy it. Um, and I will see you all hopefully in person one of these days. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye everyone. Bye.